and thank you for joining us today. This is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. We're so glad that you've decided to join us for our worship this morning. And we pray that you're having a blessed and wonderful week. Just a few announcements before we begin. It's hard to believe, but we only have a couple more weeks left in our season after Epiphany. And then, of course, we begin that longer season of of holy, uh, or that holy season, that uh, season of contemplation, season of Lent leading to uh, Holy Week and ultimately Easter itself. Uh, you, we will be having some announcements on our Facebook pages and letters going out to the congregation, but we will have resources for you that you might take some special opportunity during this season of Lent to add devotional opportunities to your worship life and to your daily devotional life. And those things are, will be downloadable, downloadable resources that you can take and use for your family and for your personal devotions. Um, as we prepare for worship, again, a reminder for those of you I know it gets so tiring just to watch worship online and on your uh, iPad or your phone or your TV or whatever it is you're watching. We do have in-person worship. However, it is, again, very limited as far as the seating goes. And we do require that people wear masks when they're here and social distance from one another. But you are welcome to come down at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We will have a short, it's an abbreviated service, it's only about 30, 35 minutes. But you're welcome to come for that worship service. Holy Communion is a part of that service. If you are not comfortable being in worship, but you just really feel like you need to get down and have a time of prayer in the sanctuary, you know you're also welcome to come between 9 and 10 a.m. every Sunday morning and after 10.30 on Sunday morning. And the sanctuary is open. I would be very happy to give Holy Communion to you and to your family. You're welcome to come and spend just a moment of prayer. And that's opportunities open to you. The same thing is true on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We have our Bible study. But prior to that, maybe 6.30, if you'd like to come a little bit early and uh, have Holy Communion, I'm here in the sanctuary and I'd be very happy to serve communion to you and to your family if you would like to come and pray. And then at 7.30, it's again only a half an hour Bible study if you want to come. And uh, right after that, uh, just you and your family and come for Holy Communion or for a time of prayer, you're welcome to do that as well. So those again are opportunities that are available to you. If you just really feel like you need to make a connection, we'd be happy to see you. Now with that in mind, we have two very, very sad uh, uh, announcements about members of our congregation. As always, I don't mention the names of families in our uh, online services, but I will tell you that a week ago today, uh, from the time I'm filming this, we had a long-term member, a lifelong member, who was born into this congregation, who died, who was president of the congregation when I came in here. He was one of the last four members of our church who were born to the original founding fathers and mothers of this church. He was one of the last four living uh, of the, that category of members. And so it just truly is a, a, um, a very great sadness for us in our church. But then here we are a week later, and we had one of our uh, younger members when I came here. She was a four-year-old. We just were informed today as well that she died. And uh, again, tragically, and uh, of course, leaving behind four children and so these are very difficult days for us. It's been a, a very rocky week, but we pray for those families who've lost loved ones because it's even harder for them. And so even though you don't know the names, just keep in mind again, especially uh, the four boys, you can just pray to God to bless them, and they certainly need God's uh, intervention right now and the family of those whom we've lost in these last two weeks. Let's take this opportunity to come before God and... Uh, repentance today, and so we invite you again to prepare your hearts for worship. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Through water and the Spirit, God gives us new life. Let us therefore confess our sin that we may be renewed in the covenant of holy baptism. Strong and faithful God, we confess that we have not lived as the body of Christ in the world. 
We have veiled our hearts from your light. We have resisted your call to follow. We have failed to exercise your gift of love. Forgive us for the sake of Christ. Heal us with your abundant grace and help us walk as children of light. Amen. The mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, came to be amongst us to proclaim release to the captives and to let the oppressed go free. Today that promise is fulfilled. God forgives us all our sins. So may the Holy Spirit strengthen you to follow Christ in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Church 
of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continue, continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken. Speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We are going to start something different starting today. Um, this was just an invitation by our, our council president this last Sunday. We have not, as of recent years, actually read the epistle lessons as a part of our worship service for a simple reason, because they don't always go together with the gospel lesson, and always the theme of the day is set by the gospel lesson. The Old Testament usually reflects the theme of the day. Uh, but I said, I realized I was a negligent pastor, so we are going to take a look at the epistle lessons over this next year as opposed to the Old Testament lessons. And so today I would like to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the first chapter, first verse. So concerning food, sacrifice the idols, Paul writes, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by Him. Hence, as the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists. And that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there are maybe so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food that they eat as offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak, it is defiled. But food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat. We are no better off if we do. So take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you 
who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to point uh, to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those, uh, those weak believers who in Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family or, and wound their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if the food is cause for their failing, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Here is the lesson. Our psalm for today is Psalm 111. Again, the congregation is welcome to respond with the every other frame. Praise the Lord. I will, I will give, give thanks, thanks to the Lord, Lord with, with my whole heart, heart in, the in the company of the upright in the, upright in the congregation. congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full, Full of honor, honor and, and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is never mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just all his, his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He, he sent redemption, redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Our gospel lesson is found in the book of Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So when they, of course that's the disciples and Jesus, went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and he taught. They were all astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, who cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent. Come out of him. So the unclean spirit convulsed him and cried with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed so that they started to question amongst themselves, What is this? A new teaching? With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So at once, Jesus' fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for the blessing of this word today, and may it touch and inspire us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. So today we talk about the authority of Jesus, and I want you, first of all, to put your thinking cap on. Remember how these last weeks I've told you that since we are in the season after Epiphany, the season after the Epiphany, the Epiphany again is the revelation of who Jesus is through the three gifts that the wise men have come to give, bring, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we need to put our thinking caps on. Today, I think it's kind of obvious that the lesson has to do with Jesus' priestly duty as compared to the priestly responsibilities of the priests of Jesus' day, because they again, the priests of Jesus' day, certainly did not have the same nature and character of this Jesus, the final and the only priest that we need. Remember, what is a priest's job? 
A priest is that person who is that, that luminous individual, okay? The person who stands between. You know, there's a coming together of heaven and earth. That's what a luminosity is, where you bring heaven and earth together and the barriers break down. That's who Jesus is. He breaks down the barriers. He is the luminous character between heaven and earth that breaks down those barriers that brings them together. And this is something that no priest has ever been able to do. By name, they're called priests. Now, you may not be aware of this. Even though you may call me pastor, in Germany, Lutheran pastors are called priests. Okay? So that is a part of our tradition as well, too. However, we're kind of priests in name only. There's really only one priest, and that is Jesus Christ. He is that luminous figure between heaven and earth. And so I want you to take a look at this lesson for today as we read this lesson. And we are told right off the bat that Jesus is a priest who teaches with real authority. Now, I'm going to tell you, when I was uh, uh, studying at, at Pittsburgh Theological and, and working on my, my degree, you know, one of the things that was, was intriguing, I, I did a, a paper where I had to read a lot of Jewish scholars because I was studying some of the... Uh, um, uh, the reclamation, I should say, of, of Israel, of, of the nation of Israel. You know, Zionism, the desire to, to reclaim Zion on behalf of the Jews and so forth. What's interesting about it, this of course was taking place in the late 1700s, 1800s, where people were thinking about the Jews returning to Israel. Of course, it didn't happen until 1948. Almost without exception, Jewish sentiment in particular, scholars was vehemently against resettling into the Promised Land because they thought it would bring a tremendous instability and a great deal of violence into the Middle East. And they did not want to introduce that. And they said, we no longer need the Promised Land. We have the Word of God. And we have been faithful to spread throughout the world as God intended to be a blessing. So their reasoning, the way they argued, was by appealing to the authority of other scholars. And so when you read Jewish scholars, you know, when we uh, actually write a paper, for instance, we try to argue from the words and the language of the scripture and so forth. But when a Jewish scholar argues about the scripture, they start quoting scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar. And it's almost as though the, the person who strings together the most scholars is the person who wins. Or, I should say, the most authoritative scholar, the one that everybody respects. Oh, you named such and such Hillel, therefore you win, because Hillel is a great scholar. Okay? So they never appeal to their own authority or to their own knowledge. So this is something that has continued through 2,000 years in Jewish scholarship. But here comes Jesus. He doesn't appeal to this person, to that prophet. He doesn't appeal to Moses. He speaks with his own authority. This is really unusual and unprecedented. So that's why, now you have to understand, it doesn't sound like it here, but the Jewish scholars are kind of offended. How dare he speak with his own authority? This would have been an offense to them. For us preachers, for me today, it's ultimately when I preach, what I say here only has authority if it comes from God. Because after all, it is God's message, and sometimes I make mistakes, and so I, I try to be very clear, this is my opinion, this is where it's not my opinion, I could be wrong, and I understand that that's true. So when I preach, the only thing that really has any authority is when I'm really hammering the Word of God, okay? Because it's not my message to preach. It is God's message that carries the authority. I have no personal authority when it comes to the Bible. And like I said, the scribes of Jesus' day would appeal to the authority of other scholars. And this appeal to authority can lead to a logical fallacy. When you quote an authority, and it's misused to prove, prove a point which the author authority never intended. Um, if you want to see this happen, just take a look at your right-wing and left-wing politically involved friends on Facebook. And all the memes that you post, yes, I'm talking about all of you out there. Right wing, left wing, doesn't matter. You post a meme and a political meme, it is wrong, guaranteed. 
because you're appealing to an authority or to somebody that really didn't mean or didn't say what you think they thought they said. You're just, you're just nonsense. It's just nonsense. Okay? Also, just because a person is seen as authority, like Hillel, he would have been, again, one of the great authorities in Jewish scholarship, doesn't mean that that scholar is always correct. So Jesus knows this. So in whose authority is he speaking? His own. Because after all, he is the gift of God to the world. Jesus preached with first-hand experience. He knew what he was talking about. He was there at the beginning of creation of the entire universe. So he didn't need to appeal to anybody else's authority in order to bolster his own. He didn't need to string together a litany, uh, a, a list of all these people who said, see, this person uh, supports me, this person supports me. He backs, now most importantly, and this is, I think, the point of today's lesson, unlike the, the Jewish uh, scribes and Pharisees and priests of Jesus' day, Jesus backs his words up with action. Jesus' demeanor would have, again, seemed very cavalier to the scribes and the Pharisees, and quite offensive. And so this is where we get this thing about this evil spirit. So Jesus speaks with authority, but now he's going to prove to them, through his actions, who he is. See, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think we talked about Jesus not really being concerned about titles, prestige, Titles don't mean anything. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He doesn't really stake a claim on those terms. He just wants to prove who he is through his actions and through his words. And so that's why he was never a big title guy. Didn't care about that. So he's going to back up his authority through the proof of what he does with this man possessed of evil spirits. Now, the Hebrew word, mazikim, uh, from which this Greek word would have been translated, uh, is a plural word, and it means those who would do harm. That's what an evil spirit is. It intends this man harm. It tends to hurt him. And that's why oftentimes we see multiple demons and one individual that are having their way with that person and destroying that person's life. So the use of the plural is indicative of their intention. They came to tag team and destroy this person's life. Create woe and destruction and chaos. When this evil spirit is confronted by Jesus, the evil spirit knows who Jesus is. You're the Holy One of God. See, even demons know who Jesus is. But as I mentioned to you, Jesus is unconcerned about these titles. His authority comes from a greater power. He doesn't care if, he's, if his ego is, is, is struck, stoked. You know, sometimes we're all concerned whether or not we get recognition and acknowledgement. That's not Jesus. So we get to verse 25. Jesus cuts the demon-possessed man short. Literally translate. First of all, let me read to you how it says it here in verse 25 in our translation. So Jesus rebuked him. That is not strong enough. The actual Greek word means he muzzled him like a dog. Okay? He muzzled the evil spirit. No priest could have done that. Because like I said, Jesus is that one between heaven and earth, that luminous character between heaven and earth. You know, a priest is just a priest by name only. You know, we might call ourselves priests, but Jesus is the true priest. So he says, be muzzled, and the evil spirit shuts up. How amazing is that? Jesus treats the demon like a puppy dog, and this puppy dog, this demon, who everybody else is afraid of, is obedient to the voice of Jesus. Now, I'm not sure why he tells the demon to shut up, except that the demon is probably really annoying. But I think there's also something in the scripture about Jesus not being prepared for a messianic testimony to be heard. That would have shortchanged his ministry. People needed to hear him preach 
and see who he was and see him in action and make up their own mind rather than just have these titles thrown at them. Jesus wants to be judged again by his actions, not his titles. And so he speaks as though he expects his demands to be fulfilled. And guess what? They are. And at this point, verse 26, the demon is finally cast out. It's not an accident, by the way, that this miracle of the casting out of the demon takes place following his preaching with authority. Because Jesus' words always bring the desired effect and result. So I want you to put on your thinking cap for a minute. This really ties us into Genesis chapter 1. And I keep going back to Genesis chapter 1. How did God create uh, uh, order out of the chaos that preexisted? With a simple word. Let there be light. And chaos was ordered. Now the word that is used in the Bible for chaos in Hebrew is timon, which is the same word as timot. Timot is the goddess of destruction in, uh, uh, in uh, Mesopotamian theology. She is a threat to the universe. She wants to destroy everything. And in Jewish theology, she's not even an animated creature or being. She is chaos. It's the word that's translated in the Bible. It could be chaos, depending on the translation that, that is used. But when you read Genesis 1, verse 2, it is often translated formless or void. This is the word timon, chaos. Okay? She is the bringer of chaos in the world. And here, guess how God brings her to heed? With a simple word. She's a puppy dog. She's not a threat. Not to our God. So again, Jesus' words bring the result. In Jewish theology, God's word has power to create. It has the power to bring order out of chaos. It has the power to cast out demons. So this miracle directly connects Jesus to God because he does something that no priest can do. Maybe you've seen some of these horror movies about priests trying to cast out demons. And I will tell you what, I've actually talked with uh, a priest who is a, a demonologist, study of, uh, of demonology, and uh, the study of demons. And he would cast out demons. This was a job. He said this would take sometimes months Jesus, with a simple word, be muzzled, be gone. The demon obeys his voice. Who does it say that Jesus is? See, you need to put your thinking cap on and realize that this is what the Bible is trying to tell us. Jesus does something that nobody else can do. Jesus' words have power. And this miracle proves that Jesus' preaching is not just simply a bluster, blustering of this man who, who's speaking off the cuff, and, and like he has authority, but he doesn't have any. No, this Jesus actually does have authority. And he's got the power to back it up. So again, how does this relate to the epiphany? Well, Jesus is the king of the universe. He is the priest between God and humans. With a simple word, this priest and this king orders, brings order out of the chaos in this man's life. It's a reminder that when Jesus makes a promise to us, Jesus has the power to keep it. I just want to bring this to... Uh, to this moment right here where we're at. I mentioned to you the deaths of two very loved, dear loved ones in our congregation. What does Jesus promise to them? His promise is the same as it was to the man dying next to him on a cross. That thief, today you will be with me in where? Paradise. We are filled with heartache because we lost two people that we dearly loved. But Jesus makes a promise to them. To be absent from the body is to be present with him. So Jesus, when he says something, his words come true. Oh, I'd much rather have these two folks with us because 
I, I've been here, they've been here my entire ministry in this congregation. I can't imagine this church without both of them. But here we are. But I have comfort in this fact that when Jesus, the priest, says something, it's going to happen. So he's made you a promise too. The promise that he's made to you and to me is that he will be with us always. So this I promise you, this is such a tumultuous time that we're living in. But I, I can tell you, you're not alone. That's not my promise. That's the promise of Jesus, the high priest, the king of the universe. Who promises to be with us. Let us rejoice and give thanks. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing on us today as we give thanks that you back up your words with action. So you made a promise to be with us, so you are with us. You made a promise that not even death could separate us from you, and so death cannot separate us from you. You made a promise to heal our broken hearts. And so we're asking that your spirit heal us. Continue to guide and direct our path this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us confess together the faith that we share. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts that are worn, worn through a season of heartache and pain, the tears for those whom we love so dearly, whom we've lost and will not continue this journey with us. We pray that you would guide and direct the family of this young woman who lost her life this week. We pray that you would welcome her home, but we be with those, especially her boys, her mom, those who loved her so dearly. For like all of us, we can't imagine a day without her. So bless her family and give them a vision a vision of her with you, and that she is at peace in your arms. The same again for our former president of this congregation, who was so faithful in service even a year ago. He was involved in our worship service, and every single Sunday was faithful to hear. Welcome him home this day as well, too. We thank you for your continued healing of this world through the gift of our doctors, our nurses, those researchers who have set us on a path, one in which we can once again be reunited soon, but we just need to be patient just a bit longer, more than we would like. And so God, we're settling in as a congregation to understand that it still may be some time before we can gather together as we would like, But we'll be patient, knowing that we are doing the best we can to raise our voices in praise to you, and you receive it gladly. Continue to be with those in the hearing of the, my voice here today, for I know that there are unique challenges in each one of their homes. In addition to the loneliness and the sorrow that they're experiencing right now, there are broken relationships, frayed relationships. Their lost jobs and wages. Those who wonder how they're going to put food on the table and pay their mortgage. Those who are struggling with cancer or other things that threaten their lives or at least their well-being. We intervene on their behalf and just beg to our High Priest, Jesus Christ our Lord, that you will bring healing into their lives this day. Whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we just take a moment of silent prayer to lift those concerns to you. In your hands, O Lord, we commit all those for whom we pray, and we trust in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so may Christ, whose epiphany revealed God's glory to the world, deepen your faith, and make your heart glad. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn for the day.
light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining Jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on